Mr. McGinley has another event, and I, I have agreed to deputise uh, on this occasion. And I'd just like to say to all the members and all the staff, uh, welcome back. Uh, hope you had a nice Christmas. And, and to the people in the public gallery, I hope Santa was good to you uh, a fortnight ago. Um, so today um, we've got a quite a full agenda, and I would imagine the people in the public gallery are here to um, hear Mr. Omar Burgudi uh, talk about uh, the BDS campaign and what we can do as a council to facilitate that. Um, but we've got a number of processes to go through uh, before we hear from Mr. Barguri. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask the Chief Executive to take us through the notice and summons of meeting and the member attendance and apologies. John. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. To all members of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you hereby summon to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, which will be a hybrid meeting conducted remotely via WebEx and physically here in the Council Chamber, uh, in the guilt hall, Tuesday the 9th of January at 4 o'clock. Alderman Cook. Online, John. Alderman Hussey. Alderman Wilkinson. Apologies, John. Thank you. Councillor Boggs. You shall, John. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Sandra Duffy. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Heaney. Sure. Councillor Jackson. Apologies from Councillor McGinley. Councillor Mooney. Councillor Farrell. And Councillor Tierney. Thank you, members. Thanks, John. I'm going to read the, the broadcast announcement. Um, I would like to remind everyone present at this meeting in the Guild Hall or in attendance remotely that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you're consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded only to have their mics and cameras on when speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found at the Council website www.derrysurban.com. Um, item four is declarations of members' interests. So, uh, if anybody would like to indicate those, um, if you're in the chamber, or, or put them in the chat box if you're attending online. Um, item five is our deputation. Uh, so, I would like to welcome Mr. Omar Bargudi, uh, who is attending online. Um, Mr. Bargudi, you're, you're very welcome here today. Uh, there's a keen interest right across the city and district in, in the BDS campaign. There's a massive interest in, in what's happening uh, in Gaza. And we're here today to, to listen to what you have to say about the campaign and how we as a council can make a difference. Um, normally, we say to anybody who's presenting to this council that you can speak for 10 minutes. but I'm not going to apply that rule uh, in these circumstances. You can speak for as long as you like, Mr. Barguri. Uh, it's an honour to have you here. Um, after you speak, we're going to open it up to members. Uh, they may have questions about what you've said, or they may have suggestions. Um, so there's going to be a question and answer session at the end. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have you here, and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I uh, deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and to engage with you on issues related to human rights. The United States, supported by the UK and other Western powers, imposed its will yet again on the UN Security Council in its latest vote last month, preventing a permanent ceasefire and an end to Israel's deadly siege of 2.3 million Palestinians in the occupied Gaza Strip. This has given the apartheid state a green light to continue its rolling massacres of tens of thousands of Palestinians, predominantly children, women, and civilian men. An expert has told CNN that the intensity of Israel's bombing had, quote, not been seen since Vietnam, end of quote. An Israeli military and intelligence uh, as Israeli military and intelligence officers have admitted to Israeli media, 
quote, everything is intentional, end of quote, in Israel's factory of mass murder in Gaza. Nearly 2 million Palestinians in Gaza have been forcibly displaced, according to the United Nations, many facing famine and the spread of infectious diseases in overcrowded, unsafe shelters. Recalling Israel's long history of mass forced displacement of Palestinians, the UN expert on the, UN, on the human rights of internally displaced persons has said that Israel's war on Gaza, quote, aims to deport the majority of the civilian population en masse, end of quote. In November, UN experts warned of an Israeli genocide in the making having already concluded earlier that Gaza had been running out of time. Given the scope of Israel's carnage, the modern day ghetto of Gaza is running out of life. As early as October 13th, prominent Israeli scholar of the Holocaust and genocide, Raz Segal, described Israel's aggression in Gaza as, quote, a textbook case of genocide. Over 880 international scholars, as well as leading U.S. and Palestinian human rights organizations and many U.S. UN experts, have also warned of an unfolding genocide in Gaza. Agreeing with Segal, senior UN official Craig Mukhaibar wrote days before leaving his post at the UN, quote, this is a textbook case of genocide. The European ethno-nationalist settler colonial project in Palestine has entered its final phase toward the expedited destruction of the last remnants of indigenous Palestinian life in Palestine. What's more, the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom, and much of Europe are wholly complicit in the horrific assault. They are in fact actively arming the assault providing economic and intelligence support and giving political and diplomatic cover for Israel's atrocities." End of quote. In genocide jurisprudence, one needs to prove the intent, which must be pondered against reality and capacity. I shall just cite a few examples of what scholars have considered as irrefutable genocidal intent. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, quote, you must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our Holy Bible, end of quote. He was referring to Samuel 15, 3, which says, quote, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass, end of quote. An Israeli government minister from the Jewish Power Party has suggested dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza. Israel's war minister, Yoav Gallant, infamously called Palestinians in Gaza, quote, human animals, prompting the US-based Jewish Voice for Peace, the world's largest Jewish anti-Zionist organization, to say, quote, as Jews, we know what happens when people are called animals. We can and we must stop this. Never again means never again for anyone." End of quote. An unprecedented dehumanization of the entire Palestinian people prevails today in mainstream Western media outlets like the BBC and in Israeli society, enabling its unfolding genocide. Calls to flatten Gaza, exterminate its residents, or ethnically cleanse them entirely have become mainstream in Israel, feeding the Israeli military's actual carpet bombing of entire neighborhoods with a clear intent to destroy life-sustaining conditions. Israel's numerous war crimes and crimes against humanity have included the intentional bombing of residential buildings refugee camps, hospitals, ambulances, bakeries, solar panels, water reservoirs, infrastructure, and the use of white phosphorus on crowded civilian neighborhoods. The UN is warning that many Palestinians, especially children, may dehydrate to death as clean water runs out. While Oxfam and Palestinian human rights organizations have condemned Israel's use of, quote, starvation as a weapon of war, end of quote. 
The extent of this U.S.-Israeli induced hunger in Gaza, according to experts' reports, has eclipsed even the near famines in Afghanistan and Yemen of recent years. Israel has killed more civilians in Gaza in 30 days than Russia has in its entire war in Ukraine, which began almost two years ago. But the gory timeline of life and death did not begin with the Palestinian paramilitary group's attack on Israeli military bases and settlements around Gaza on October 7th, during which hundreds of Israeli civilians and soldiers were killed. Every civilian life matters. But where you start the timeline in any situation of oppression is a strong indicator of your moral compass. After 16 years of a near total Israeli siege, designed to, quote, put the Palestinians on a diet, but not to make them die of hunger, end of quote, as its architect once admitted, Gaza was turned into an unlivable zone, according to the UN. The healthcare system was near collapse. 96% of the water was undrinkable. 60% of children were anemic and many suffered from stunted growth due to severe malnutrition. A generation of young Palestinians was psychologically scarred from the bombings and the siege. And this was before. Now, Gaza is a site of unfolding genocide. Even someone like me, a Palestinian human rights defender who has for four decades experienced, documented, and peacefully resisted Israel's 75-year-old regime of settler colonialism and apartheid, cannot quite know how to deal with the world's first televised genocide. The UN Secretary General has sounded the alarm that Israel's war on Gaza poses a serious threat to world peace and security. Indeed, if Israel evades accountability, this would usher in a new era of might makes right that threatens weaker nations and communities worldwide if they dare to defy systems of domination and subjugation and pursue justice. Israel's impunity is reducing the already frail foundations of international law to tatters, as Irish President Michael D. Higgins puts it. Much of the Western establishment has duly parroted Israel's claim that Palestinian armed groups attack on October 7th was, quote, unprovoked, and Israel's assertion about its right to self-defense, quote. Allow me to share five points on this based on my ethical perspective. First, as the Brazilian philosopher Paulo Freire writes, quote, with the establishment of a relationship of oppression, violence has already begun. Never in history has violence been initiated by the oppressed. Violence is initiated by those who oppress, who exploit, who fail to recognize others as persons, not by those who are oppressed, exploited, and unrecognized, end of quote. The reaction of the oppressed, whether one considers any aspect of it morally or legally justifiable or not, is always just that, a reaction to the initial violence of the oppressor. Second, well before October 7th, Israel's far-right government, its most racist, fundamentalist, sexist, and homophobic ever, had been ruthlessly escalating its ethnic cleansing, siege, pogroms, incarceration, and daily humiliation of millions of Palestinians, hoping we would surrender and accept oppression as fate. Third, as affirmed by the International Court of Justice in 2004, and as prominent international law experts and the South African government remind us, Israel as the occupying power does not have the right to self-defense using military means against the Palestinians under its occupation. Moreover, the Genocide Convention does not allow for any justification to perpetrate genocidal acts. Genocide 
cannot be undertaken as retaliation to unlawful acts, no matter how serious. And of course, now South Africa is suing Israel at the International Court of Justice for genocide. International law actually recognizes the right of all peoples resisting foreign occupation and colonization to resort to armed struggle. However, the use of force against civilians is strictly prohibited, and the BDS movement endorses this principle. Fourth, condemning any illegal or immoral acts of violence that the oppressed may commit in resisting oppression is acceptable only if the condemning party has earned the moral standing to do so by being already on record condemning the prevailing system of oppression, the initial violence. Fifth, since oppression is the root cause of violence, those who sincerely care about ending all violence like we do must act to end oppression. As the struggle that ended apartheid in South Africa has shown, ending state, corporate, and institutional complicity in Israel's system of oppression, especially through the nonviolent tactics of BDS, is the most effective form of solidarity. The BDS movement was launched in 2005 by the absolute majority in Palestinian society. It calls for ending Israel's military occupation, dismantling its system of apartheid, and respecting the right of Palestinian refugees to return home. Anchored in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the BDS movement categorically opposes all forms of racism, including Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. BDS targets complicity, not identity. Over the last 18 years, BDS has won global support from trade unions, farmers' coalitions, as well as racial, social, gender, and climate justice movements, together representing tens of millions worldwide. It has compelled large multinationals like Puma, G4S, Veolia, Orange, to end their involvement in Israel's human rights violations, and it has played a key role in the decisions by large sovereign funds and major US churches, especially Protestant churches in the US, to divest from complicit companies and Israeli banks. Recognizing that ending complicity is not only a prerequisite to meaningful solidarity, but also the most profound moral, ethical obligation everyone and every entity has, city councils worldwide have adopted diverse effective measures. Barcelona has cut all relations with apartheid Israel's government in response to its ongoing genocide, as have the Belgian city councils of Liège and Verviers, long before the current genocide. The city councils of Oslo in Norway and Belém in Brazil have also adopted meaningful policies to end complicity. The Barcelona city council is also actively pressuring the Spanish, Spanish government to impose a full military embargo on Israel. Highlighting the intersectional and organic nexus between the struggle for Palestinian freedom, justice and equality, and struggles for racial, social, economic, gender and climate justice, based on the tenets of international law and the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, rejecting all forms of racism and appreciating that your city council's tender bids must be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis and that no bidding company must be excluded from tenders or contracts because of its geographical scope of activity, sourcing location, national identity or origin, I therefore propose on behalf of the BDS movement to your esteemed council to consider adopting the following an ethical procurement policy that takes into account the involvement of bidders and members of its economic entity in grave professional misconduct, including grave violations of human rights and or international law, and allows the council to exclude problematic bidders from its tender procedures. This ethical procurement policy will incorporate widely accepted and precisely formulated international norms and standards of business and human rights to explain clearly when exclusion from tenders is justified.
to end if you hate violence and oppression if you hate oppression and complicity if you love freedom justice dignity and equality for all irrespective of identity as we do mobilize pressure to help us dismantle Israel's 75-year-old regime of settler colonialism and apartheid, as well as all forms of oppression. But for now, we need your full support to help stop the Gaza genocide. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that contribution, Mr. Bargudi. Um, we have two speakers who have indicated thus far. Um, first of all, it's Councillor Sean Harkin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Chair, for being so welcoming to Omar today. And uh, uh, thank you, Omar, for taking time to be here today. I, I, I know that it must be a very difficult time for you right now and also a very, very busy time, an exceptionally busy time. Um, and, and your presentation uh, was, uh, as expected, excellent in terms of um, uh, being able to cut through and explain uh, in, a, in a very easy way what um, what is happening in Gaza today and why there is... Uh, why uh, the background to October 7th um, and 75 years of uh, Nakba. Um, we, we have, as you know, Omar, passed a motion here uh, at our council. Um, it was first passed, uh, I think, before I was a councillor. Uh, I think Christ <laughs> Councillor Christopher Jackson uh, proposed it uh, to support BDS. And we have attempted to implement uh, boycott, divestment, uh, sanctions at the council level, but we've been frustrated because of the legalities here. Um, so it's been frustrating for us as councillors who uh, support BDS, uh, especially now in the context of um, the British government's attempt to basically prohibit our ability to uh, advance uh, BDS through the council. And obviously, uh, following that, uh, you know the 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 gas the the genocide that is being taking place right now uh, in Gaza. So we want to uh, take meaningful action that will put pressure on the Israeli state and put pressure on corporations that are complicit in assisting Israel to carry out genocide right now, uh, and who are profiting from apartheid and are profiting from uh, the occupation. Um, so it's very very. Uh, it's great to hear from you uh, about what's happening in Barcelona and what's happening with Barcelona City Council. It's great to hear about the Belgian and the Norwegian councils. So, so it shows that uh, councils can take action. Um, and we're determined not to be bullied by the British government. Uh, and their, their, uh, their proposals aren't yet uh, law and may not be law and can be challenged uh, in, in any event anyway. And I think that the, your proposal for an ethical procurement policy, um, uh, where uh, anyone really who, any entity who is involved in uh, or complicit with human rights abuses would be excluded, uh, seems right and just. Um, and that would obviously apply to uh, Israel or any state that would be involved uh, or any entity that might be involved in assisting a state um, with the carrying out crimes against humanity. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, I have spoke to my uh, fellow uh, councillors uh, who, are, who are BDS supporters, and I, I think we can say we are going to collectively support your proposal today. Um, we are setting up um, uh, in the council a boycott divestments working group, um, and that working group would, would work through um, how to implement this uh, and get input as to exactly how to go about doing it, um, because we want to get past this barrier where we, we can't take meaningful action, and we want to do it as speedily as we can. Um, so 
that those are my initial thoughts, Omar, on your presentation. I, I, I know you're going to be in Derry soon, and we can kind of follow up on this discussion there, because uh, there's, there's a session planned with you to talk about BDS. Um, but again, you know, on behalf of uh, my party, People Before Profit, and you should know that there's people here in the public gallery to hear your presentation and to support you. I want to thank you for being here today and for your work. Thank you, Councillor Hargan. Next indicated speaker is Councillor Jackson. Christopher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I want to extend a huge welcome to Omar. Um, and I lo I, I like Councillor Hargan has outlined that I look forward to welcoming you to the city personally um, later on in January. Um, and that was a powerful, um, it, it was a powerful deputation. And it's probably one of the most powerful presentations that has ever been um, presented to this council, given the televised genocide that's currently underway. And Omar, you've outlined, um, you've outlined it better than any of us um, could have around the current situation in Gaza, um, where it has stemmed from, and what we can take as a what action we can take as a public authority um they they take a stand they ensure that international law is protected um omar it, it was myself that brought the motion the council they endorse and they support the bds campaign in 2016. um that that was taken um following various meetings with yourself um, I know we've had quite a lot of conversations prior to um, posing that motion, and we've had quite a lot of, we've had a few conversations afterwards um, expressing our frustration and working collectively um, to, to see how we can overcome some of the, the legislative barriers that are in place. And it's it has been a frustrating, uh, a frustrating time. There's been subsequent motions that have been presented to this council um, since that hasn't been able to advance council's uh, implementation of the BDS movement. But one thing that has remained firm is our council's commitment and um, solidarity to the Palestinian people and for the right to uh, the, the right to return um, to the, pa pa the Palestinian people. And that that's something that our council is very, very proud of uh, and will continue. Um, and, I, and I suppose that resolve has, if anything, has strengthened um, right across society as we see what's, what's unfolding in Gaza before very very eyes. I know, Omar, you, you mentioned yourself um, that you don't know what what, what they do in, in in the wake of of the televised genocide that's ongoing in Gaza. And I, I feel that um, our president, uh, Michael D. Higgins, um, referred to international law. And if international law is going to mean anything, it needs to be enforced. And what we're seeing now is the, the, the pregnant breaches of international law, the consequences of that um, results in the, the, the scenes that we're seeing um, coming from Gaza. And that can't be acceptable anywhere in the world. And if we all take the same stand and, and in your, your opposing oppression, um, opposing violence, and promoting peace, justice, dignity, and equality for all, we need to ensure that international law is respected uh, right across the board. And an ethical procurement policy is one step that this council could take. Um, they, in, they ensure that we, that any corporations um, 
are mindful of who or what regimes are they're in support of. So there's, I, I, I do know that, that our party, um, Sinn Féin, have been working for almost two years now on, uh, I, I believe with yourself, Omar, on on the the wording of of, of a, a motion that could be implemented in councils the length and breadth of this island, um, and that the the, the it, 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 it does along the lines of the ethical procurement policy. This is something that we are fully supportive of. Um, delighted to see that it's brought before this council now. We could be the first council on, on this island. They they endorse this, um, but I have no doubt, uh, and I'm assured that this will be brought to councils right across the 32 counties of this island. So collectively, that voice becomes so much stronger, and. I, I, I just want to finish by saying I, once again, um, we, we want to thank you for your for your deputation, but um, our solidarity um, to all the people in Palestine um, remains steadfast and strong at this very very difficult time. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, next indicated speaker is Councillor Tierney. Brian. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose um, to begin, uh, like others, um, I want to welcome Omar uh, here today and thank him um, for what I consider to be a very powerful um, deputation. Um, and like others have already mentioned, I look forward to welcoming you uh, to Derry, Omar, um, later on um, in this month. Um, listening to uh, your contribution, there was quite a lot of powerful um, statements contained within it. Um, but for me, um, I suppose the most powerful one um, was almost at the, at, the, at the very end where you said, if you hate violence, end oppression. And that sums it up um, for me. Um, and we, um, as a society, should be doing all we can um, to show our support um, to the people um, of Gaza and doing all that we can to support the BDS movement, which, as others have already outlined, um, this council um, has a very um, strong track record on, as does the, the previous um, Derry City Council. Um, I think the, the first um, notice of motion um, in support of, of BDS in this city was in 2008. Um, when Derry, the former Derry City Council um, supported the BDS movement at that stage, um, which shows the, the, the track record that um, this uh, area has um, in, in supporting that. Um, I have spoken in, the, in this council um, on a number of occasions um, since the, and the unfortunate um, escalation um, of violence um, in Palestine um, in October, um, and at every occasion said, that whatever we can do to end what is happening in Palestine, we should be doing. And if that means that, once again, um, if that means um, the this council adopting an ethical procurement policy, um, and that has some way to go to try and show our support um, to you um, and to the people um, who are involved with the, with the BDS campaign, then I believe that we um, should be doing that. And the SDLP chair have no um, issue in supporting Councillor Harkins' um, proposal um, whenever it comes before the floor. There are um, a number of large organizations which are um, against the, the, the BDS movement. And I think um, that for, for you and, and people with, within your organization, that's um, quite difficult. Um, no more so than the, the current British government. And there is a, a, a vote tomorrow night in the House of Commons uh, where the British government are trying to stop councils um, from adopting uh, a BDS um, policy. Um, Omar, you may not be aware of this, but this council district is made up of three parliamentary constituencies. And I'm quite proud to say that at least one of the MPs representing this council area will tomorrow night vote against um, that proposal by the British government. And that's the MP for FOIL, um, Colin Eastwood. Um, others can decide what, what, what they're going to do uh, when, when that vote comes. But I think as a city and district council, we need to do all we can to support um, the BDS movement. Um, and that's what we uh, within the SDLP will continue to try and do. And if that means um, 
adopting an ethical procurement policy, um, then we should get on with doing that work and seeing the, the outworkings of that within uh, the BDS Working Group Chair. Um, and we're happy to do that. But once again, Omar, um, thanks very much for your, for your presentation. Um, and, and as I say, I look forward to welcoming you uh, to Derry um, later on in the month. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And the final indicated speaker is Councillor Donnelly. You all right? Am I okay, Chair? And uh, thanks, Omar, for your very powerful uh, presentation. People in this city and this indeed this country know what it's like to have to be under the imperialist jackboot. Uh, we know what it's like for a media, a world media that blames the oppressed. Uh, and fails to deal with the oppressor. Uh, we have two artificial states in this country. We have a counter-democratic process, and it all stems from the same organization, the same British imperialism that has destroyed the Palestinian state. Uh, you know, there, the, there's those who will try to imply that what happened, what, what is currently ongoing in, in Palestine, as, is, is as a result of what happened on October the 7th. The people of Ireland and people of the world know that that's false. You know, myself and other people have spent decades before October the 7th campaigning and protesting against uh, Zionism and, and what Israeli occupation is doing in, in, in Palestine. And the clamor for condemnation following October the 7th. I think it's it's on your fourth point that you made, and I'll just read it out again. Condemning any illegal or immoral acts of violence that the oppressed may commit in resisting oppression is acceptable only if the condemned party has earned the moral standing to do so by being already on record condemning the prevailing system of oppression, the initial violence. I think that sums it up. And far from condemning the, the oppression, the, the world leaders have endorsed it, they have enabled it, they have financed it, and indeed those shouting the loudest about condemnation are responsible for numerous, countless wars and the deaths of millions of, of, of people, most of them uh, civilians and non-combatants, and a lot of these wars were, were, were based, or the justification was, was based on lies and, and, and falsehoods. Uh, people in this country, many, many thousands of people, I, I don't believe that, that, that governments uh, truly and honestly reflect the feelings of, 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 of the people of, of countries. Certainly not the case in, in, in many countries throughout the world. People can see it happening on social media. People are seeing genocide being played out and they're contrasting that with a media that is, in my opinion, complicit. The deliberate targeting of, of and you've outlined them all there, but the deliberate banning of journalists from, from, from the area and the deliberate killing and maiming of journalists, not only journalists, but their families in order to prevent the truth being shown to the world is 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 testament that that what's happened here, what what Israel is doing is is complete and utterly morally wrong and cannot be justified. Uh, you know, basically what we're seeing here is a second Nakba, uh, and there is no doubt that the U.S. and the U.K. governments are complicit in enabling this to happen and. The silence is, is complicit. Those who are silent whilst this is playing out in front of the world are, are, are responsible for it. Uh, not only do we need a ceasefire, but we need an end to the occupation. This isn't about calling a halt to the deaths, which should happen immediately, but it's not about normalizing the terrorist uh, uh, state of Israel. That terrorist state of Israel in its current form 
needs to be dismantled and a democratic process needs to be applied in an area. I just want to pay tribute to Omar for the sterling work that you have done. And I want to send a message that okay. many, many thousands of people in this country are, are with the Palestinian people in their, in their hour of need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, we, we have no more indicated speakers. Uh, so, Mr. Burguri, um, nobody has asked one question at all. All I've heard from this chamber is unwavering support, which I would say is generally reflective of, of the population of this uh, city and district. And you know, each member that spoke uh, spoke about their support uh, for the the introduction of an ethical procurement policy. So you know, anything that we can do as a council to stop the murder, to stop the terror, to stop the occupation, uh, we're going to do that. Um, but before I get Councillor Harkin to formally propose that, um, make that proposal. Have you anything else you would like to add? Because you've heard a lot of people uh, singing your praises, uh, supporting uh, the cause, sending sol solidarity. Would you have any final comments to make, Mr. Barguti? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I de dearly appreciate uh, the council members' uh, presentations. I, I really appreciate the solidarity. Uh, I've been to Derry uh, before, and indeed, uh, wherever I go on, on, on that island, I feel at home. Uh, the Irish people have um, welcomed Palestinians and stood for the Palestinian cause for, for a very, very long time. I just wanted to say that uh, um, you will hear from legal counselors uh, sometimes uh, arguments against even an ethical procurement policy. You will hear from uh, detractors all kinds of arguments saying oh, this is discriminatory, this is uh, maybe in violation with British law, this might even be uh, uh, problematic in terms of what the British government is trying to pass tomorrow in, in, in Parliament. And we've strongly opposed that anti-BDS legislation that the Tory government is, is pushing uh, in, in Parliament. And in fact, there's a very large coalition of, of uh, public bodies and, and democratic institutions that stand against it because they see it not just as a threat to advocacy of Palestinian rights, they see it as a threat to all justice struggles. And this is the point I want to make. Those who think that the right wing and, and the British government in particular will stop at just suppressing support for Palestine, support for BDS, are wrong as happened in the US with US state legislatures, tens of state legislatures passed anti-BDS legislation. And we warned at the time that they will come after every justice movement. And indeed in three years, they started using the same anti-BDS legislation as templates verbatim to suppress black voters' rights, to suppress the climate justice movement, to suppress women's reproductive rights and so on and so forth. The same is bound to happen by the British government. If they succeed with this McCarthyite, absolutely anti-democratic repressive measure, they will go after the trade unions, they will go after the justice struggles across the country. And, and this will hurt uh, everyone. So the final point I wanna make is that Palestinians are not asking for charity. We're really asking for solidarity. But even before both, we're demanding an end to complicity. It's, it's not a charitable thing to end complicity, to do no harm. It's a profound moral obligation to stop harming us. Investments in companies, procurement from companies that are killing us, destroying our homes is harming us. So ending uh, procurement from companies involved in human rights violations anywhere, and this is what we're proposing is not a Palestine specific, procurement policy, but a general human rights procurement policy. Anyone who stands against it, stands against human rights writ large. Thank you. So folks, um, with, within the presentation that, that Mr. Barcudi provided uh, to the councillors, there was 
suggested wording for a motion which Councillor Hargan has indicated that he would like to formally propose, having spoken to other councils, other councillors. Uh, so, do you want to make that recommendation, Councillor Hargan? Thank you, uh, and again, thank you, Omar, for your concluding remarks there, and uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, so, if I can, uh, and it's acceptable to uh, everyone else, can we propose it in my own name, and in, in Councillor Jackson's name, uh, Councillor Tierney, and Councillor Donnelly, uh, that we endorse and accept uh, and uh, support the proposal for an ethical procurement policy um, that uh, Omar has laid out there. That's acceptable to me. <laughs> um, I assume there, there, there's no dissent in the chamber. Can we have a formal set? Well, two, two seconds, Bonneman Hoggy Hussey. Uh, can we have a formal seconder? Just to keep things right, Sandra, Councillor Duffy. Um, Alderman Hussey, would you like to comment? Uh, clarification is that the uh, motion that Omar has proposed in his text or the separate longer suggested motion that we're considering? I, I would assume it's the longer version, but I will let Councillor Harkin clarify that. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm happy to accept and propose the, 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 and I believe that we were proposing the longer one. And I think that this would uh, refer to the BDS working group to figure out uh, how to move it forward um, with input. Chair, in view of that. Uh, can the council solicitor give some input as to the validity of our being able to enact the motion? I'm going to ask the city solicitor to comment on that directly. Yeah, um, so. Um, <clears throat> Chair, through you, um, as always, the position would be that the uh, motion uh, would, in due course, be subject to a further paper, uh, which would come forward um, and be placed before uh, the Council um, uh, when all matters have been considered. And as Councillor Harkin has indicated himself in relation to this matter, that would be following discussion within the um, BDS working group uh, in due course as well. Chair, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alderman Hussey. I, I see that Alderman Cook has asked to see the motion in writing. It's now on the screen. And I see that Alderman Kerrigan would like to speak. Keith? Th thank you, Chair. I was only just uh, basically, I was requesting to get the motion up on the screen there because I thought it was having a bit of problems with the WebEx because it asked to be downloaded there. But uh, at, at this stage here, uh, as I say, we're content with with the speaker being in and and uh, raising his issues, but uh, our group and had uh, opposed the BDS uh, uh, motion when it was brought forward in the council, and I would be minded we will still at this stage continue just to oppose it. Thank you, Chair. Oppose or abstain, Alderman Kerrigan. I don't know if I need to call a vote on this. So could you indicate the the DUP party position, please? I think we will oppose it, Chair. Oppose. Um, Chief Executive, can you go see a vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Alderman Cook? Against. Alderman Hussey? Abstain. Um, Councillor Boggs? Ta, John. Councillor Donnelly? Councillor Sandra Duffy? Ta. Councillor Farrell? For Councillor Harkin, Councillor Heaney, Aye. Councillor Jackson, Aye. Councillor Mooney, Councillor O'Farrell, and Councillor Tierney. For thank you, members. Chair, I've recorded ten for one against and one abstention, so the proposal passes. Okay. Um,
Uh, so, Mr. Burkut, he, he, he may not have followed uh, quite closely what happened in the chamber. Basically, we've had a vote and we've agreed to adopt uh, that under council policy. It will be referred to a working group, which we have established, uh, to understand how we actually implement that policy. And I know you're, you're going to be on the study for the, the Bloody Sunday lecture uh, at the end of this month, and I hope, I hope to actually meet you in person. Uh, so, it's been an honour, it's been a pleasure. And and thank you very much for attending today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Now for the boring stuff. Uh, we're going to move on to the rest of the meeting. Uh, so people in the public gallery, you are welcome to stay, but it's not, it's not essential. Um, so I, item number six is chairperson's business. Um, I've only been contacted by one member, uh, which is Councillor Harkin. And I understand that Councillor Harkin would like to speak on the International Holocaust Memo Memorial Day. Sean. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And um, yeah, look, there's a lot happening in the world. And um, at the end of this month, we will be commemorating uh, a massacre carried out on our own streets uh, over the 52nd anniversary of Bloody Sunday. And on the 27th of January is the International Holocaust Memorial Day. And look, as a council, we have, uh, for a number of years, passed very, very strong motions to acknowledge, recognise um, the, the Holocaust. Uh, we passed a very strong motion in 2021 uh, where we agreed that we would uh, commit ourselves to be part of the call and campaign to say never again. And I think that uh, this year uh, we should do so again. Um, I have a very short um, proposal that I'll send to Paul now. Give me a second. But I think that we can agree that there is a, uh, a growing far right across the world. And who uh, at the core of their ideology is anti-Semitism and hatred of Jewish people. Not only uh, that, but that is central to their uh, belief system. And it's frightening that we see the growth of the far right across Europe uh, and the United States, but not only in places far away, but here in Ireland as well. Um, and I think we want to do as a council everything we can to stand against anti-Semitism um, and to stand against all forms of discrimination. So I would like to see our council uh, in, uh, in, in an appropriate way marking the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, be that on, you know, on the day, possibly sharing uh, a candle, uh, which is what uh, organizations are doing. Uh, there will be a vigil here in Derry um, that will be uh, sponsored and supported by many organizations in the Peace Garden at 4.30 on January 27th. Um, but I, th I think it's important as a council that we continue uh, to stand against anti-Semitism, anti um, to stand against the rise of the far right, um, and to remember uh, and to never forget uh, the, 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 um, the Holocaust. So I'll send that to Paula right now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Um, we're just going to wait it comes up on the screen. I think you may have a seconder in the form of Councillor Donnelly.
is that the, the entire motion or that's that in its entirety? Yep. Okay. All right, folks, so everybody in the chamber and everybody uh, that's online um, can see that. Um, it's been proposed by Councillor Hargan. Councillor Donnelly, would you wish to speak on this formally? Well, Chair, Chair, it was just the, the, the seconded and they say that, you know, one, what the never as as Omar Bergudi said, never again means never again for for anyone, and that any form of hate because of somebody's uh, race or or religion or you know homophobia or Islamophobia is wrong, and and that the current events being uh, carried out by Zionism, you know we cannot allow that to be used by. Uh, the far right or by fascism, they promote anti, you know, uh, Semitism. So just uh, happy the the uh, the second uh, councillor Harkins motion. Thank you. Thank you, councillor Donnelly. The next indicated speaker is councillor Mooney. Sean. Thank you, chair, and just to say thank you to councillor Harkin for bringing this motion. Um, we've just heard from Mr. Burgundy about the current devastating events that's happening in Gaza, but. You know, not the Holocaust was really only about 75 years ago, and the events that and arose out of that was, again, the virulent form of nationalism, which is called fascism, you know, and that's the evil, toxic, you know, events that arise out of that sinister form of nationalism, which has, you know, has been called fascism. And we thought that post-World War II, that these events were managed by we call New World Order, but again, fascism is on the rise, hasn't gone away, and it's still here, and it's raising its head again throughout the world. We see societies throughout the world that are, you know, and it's um, influences, and obviously um, we, as our own council, but, you know, all we can do is to challenge this in our own area, and, of course, the SDLP group would be very happy to support this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sean. Um, next on the case speaker is Councillor Duffy. Sandra. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and thank you to Councillor Harkin for bringing the proposal. Um, Sinn Féin obviously will be supportive of it. Um, just to concur with everything the previous speakers have said in terms of um, the where we are now and the fact that we do need to learn from history. We have seen um, over recent times the rise of the far right. We have to stand firmly against toxic nationalism, racism, fascism and the far right. But we also need to be mindful that we need to learn the lessons of the past and not allow genocide as we have seen in the past to happen right in front of our eyes. Um, but we will be taking part in any events that um, are, are are held in relation to Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, and thanks to Councillor Harkin for bringing the proposal. Okay, thank you, Sandra. So that, that's passed unanimous, unanimously. So well done, Councillor Harkin. Um, next item on the agenda is item seven, which is the matters arising from December's governance meeting, which was actually in November. Uh, so does anybody have any matters arising? Nobody? Okay. Um, item eight is the Anti-Poverty Action Plan, and we've got Una McGillian to take us through that. Una? Thank you, Chair. Um, members, the purpose of this report is to seek your endorsement of the proposed approach towards the development of an Anti-Poverty Action Plan. And um, Without going into the detail of the background, you'll be very familiar with a lot of this information as it pertains to a motion that came to Council um, two years ago, and there was a number of different actions associated with that, and we've given you an overview in terms of the progress that has been achieved with respect to all of them, and um, particularly around a lot of the champion and um, the work that we've done around lobbying with the poverty research and really trying to draw to the attention of government departments in the context of the proposed DFC anti-poverty strategy. Um, members, we also um, worked very, very closely with our local stakeholders, um, particularly around a lot of the work that they were doing, and listening very, very carefully um, to what they felt was the real priorities coming forward, and that influenced the Hardship Fund, um, has influenced a lot of the interventions that have been taken forward by Council. But there's a real desire um, for a move to 
move away from reacting to people in poverty to actually preventing from people getting into poverty in the first place. And um, for that reason, since November, the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group, the member Task and Finish Group, has been meeting to consider an approach in terms of what would be the best way to take that forward. And again, our local um, groups have been um, very, very mindful of a lot of people with lived experience. And that's definitely a sense of the people that are coming forward now. They are very, very well placed in terms of being able to guide and to develop um, any kind of action plan that come forward. And for that reason, I want to draw your attention to Section 3, um, which is the key issue. So um, it's really important that we recognise that as a local authority, um, we have limited ability in terms of what we can do around poverty. This is really um, a central policy directive. Um, it requires very, very significant resources. But within the context of our own strategic inclusive growth plan, there's already a roadmap there. There's already interventions that have been identified. And the idea would be to try to pull all of this together in terms of a context of a small number of meaningful interventions that would actually um, have an impact. Um, and then within the section um, three, we also outline what that approach would be around an initiation meeting um, and that would be meeting with the key stakeholders around the design of particular workshops um, both in March and April and from those workshops actually unpicking the areas of where we feel that we can either have an influence towards increasing income that will go on to households or reducing costs um, and being able to um, increase access towards skills and employability. And members, you'll be familiar with a lot of interventions that are already taking place within our local area around labour market, around social value, um, around community wealth building. And the idea would be that this anti-poverty action plan will be building on all those foundations with coming forward with a small number of interventions. So members, we've outlined in that section three, the proposed approach um, very much that this would be an open to all um, opportunity, anybody who would want to get involved in that, and that would be reflected in the communications that we would take forward. Um, it would be subject to um, a consultation process and would keep members advised of the development of this um, through various reports to governance and also in terms of our task and finish group. So very happy to take any questions or um, any comments members might have. Thanks for that, Una. Um, have we got any, anybody wish to ask any questions? Councillor Hartman? Well, it's just to thank Una again, uh, because uh, I, I've been, uh, as others have been, to the uh, working group where we went through these uh, discussions and proposals. And look, I think we, as a council, we're very frustrated. We, we know that the council can only do so much and that um, a government with proper resources uh, can actually put a proper dent into uh, poverty, inequality, raising wages, improving benefit, uh, uh, improving benefits, and uh, you know making our public services better are all the key ways I think build the big blocks that can actually improve uh, the lives of many many people. But that's not happening right now. And I think as a council, we are figuring, we are trying to figure out and be very strategic about whatever resources we have that we utilise them in the best possible way. And that's what the that's what Una has been doing and our team and that's what we've been doing as a, a working group and I think we've learned a lot over the last number of years with our different initiatives uh, and the way that we've worked with all our partners. Um, and I think it's right to invite in, uh, you know, the broad range of organisations that Una mentioned. Uh, and, and we don't want to give people, a, we, I think we don't want to waste people's time by bringing people in to talk about anti-poverty plans when there's nothing there to do. So I think that being realistic as well about, it's about what council can do can I, in the meantime to do everything it can uh, with our resources, with uh, you know the input of as many people as possible uh, will be beneficial for people. So thank you. And then um, I, I don't know if there's, we need to endorse this, but I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so the next indicated speaker and final indicated speaker, as I see, is Councillor Mooney. Sean. Thank you, Chair. And just to uh, reiterate what Councillor Harkin said there, I know you sit on the, the task of finish group for our group in Italy, and I think you just do welcome the hard work to Bayona and her team and the members input as well. They, 
the ticket here so far. And just here, the welcome view on the welcome. Um, and I said about prevention, the aspect of prevention is always that old saying, prevention is better than cure. But I mean, I just acknowledge that we as a, as a council have got limited resources to deal with this sort of issue. Um, but welcome um, the reinstatement of Stormont and Executive. And we can maybe try and, you know, ameliorate the problems that are out there uh, through that venue rather than, uh, but as always, this council is putting their shoulder to win and doing their best to try and help out. So. I'll uh, happily second that um, recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sean. And last on the key of speaker is Councillor Boggs. Paul. Thank you very Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Anna. Um, I suppose just to reiterate on behalf of Sinn Féin what, what others have said already, um, there's a lot of detail on it, um, and I think it builds on a lot of what uh, we need to see um, already, particularly the aspect of not one size fits all. There isn't ever going to be an approach of anything, any scheme um, or support that, that council or the community and voluntary sector uh, develop that is going to um, target everybody that needs the support. So obviously there needs to be that flexible. Then it's good to see that um, built on. And, and just like it has been mentioned by the previous speaker, uh, we could do a whole lot more in terms of anti-poverty and, and the anti-poverty strategy um, right across the north if we had an assembly and executive, and I think that's where we need to get to. But in the meantime, without that, um, as that lingers on and on and on um, unnecessarily, uh, I think it's very, very important that we have initiatives like this coming through uh, local government level. So just to commend yourself and the team for, for the work so far, and I look forward, and Sinn Féin look forward to the development of, uh, of that work going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. So that's unanimous. Uh, there's no dissent. Um, so that recommendation um, that we proceed with the work of the Anti-Poverty uh, Task and Funnies Group uh, has been approved. Uh, and as Councillor Mooney had said, I'm the SLP representative on that group. And I would just like to say to Una, the work that you put under that is just unbelievable so dedicated so diligent and you know if it wasn't for you this wouldn't happen and like i get the fact that you know addressing poverty is the role of dfc is the role of various departments uh and stormont there's only so much we can do but i know when you're leading on this that, that we're going to do it because uh that's you know the focus that you have on this particular issue. But I think the last time we spoke about this, when it was proposed, I had mentioned about the fact that there is no anti-poverty strategy for the North. It was meant to be implemented in 1998, and 26, late, 26 years later, we still don't have one. And it's taken a high court ruling to actually force Stormont to produce one. Um, I know there's a draft strategy at the moment, I know that it needs executive approval, but we need an executive to get executive approval. So things aren't going to change um, to a massive degree um, unless we have an accountable government in, in Belfast and Stormont. So the sooner that returns, uh, the better it's going to be for citizens right across the north. Um, so the next item is item nine uh which is the scheme of alliances um uh, we've got ellen cabinet they take us through that item thank you chair um again the purpose of this report is to advise members of the consolidated councillor uh, alliance circular lg23 um, which has been issued at the end of november um, and in the context of that circular to seek approval for an updated scheme of alliances um, the report itself sets out in the background the, the, the number of decisions that members have made regarding this the, uh, the theme of, and of the scheme of alliances. And indeed, um, last year and the year before that, um, the collective view of members was it was um, inappropriate um, to be awarding themselves a pay increase. Uh, particularly during a cost of living crisis, and that uh, members decided to write to DFC asking that the independent review panel be established as soon as possible um, to determine if it is appropriate for councillors to vote on their own level of pay. And also at that time, as I say, the current pay lift uh, was deferred and not awarded um, until that review panel um, was to bring forward a decision. The 
Appendices include the correspondence that was sent to DFC at that time and the subsequent response. Again, as I say, um, from that, we, we have an indication that DFC doesn't see members as as actually um, voting on their own pay rises, but they have been provided with the maximum limits which can be considered. Um, the key issues then is that the, um, the draft scheme which has been prepared at Appendix 2 reflects the new circular. Um, and it's also noted, I suppose, in terms of the key issues that the current uh, payments for members on their basic and responsibility allowances are actually based on the 2019 um, pay rates. Um, and therefore, the implementation of, of the new circular guidance really brings the um, a potential increase in that uh, basic allowance by approximately £2,000. Um, it's also noted that the subsistence allowances relate to the year 2015 and travel allowances relate to the 2017 rates. Um, there are no proposals within the new scheme to make any changes to the mayor and deputy mayor allowances and they're fixed at the 2019 rates. Um, so in terms of, as I say, the um, implications of this, there's, um, it's noted that um, the, free, the council has, has had a cost of living crisis and has continued previously to freeze the allowances, but that may be unsustainable in, in the future. And that was discussed last year. So the recommendation in front of members today is for your consideration that subject to your comments, the updated scheme of allowances based on circular um, L2323 uh, is adopted. Um, the final point on that is, is I would highlight that those are maximum allowances and members may have discretion to um, set, up, set rates which are up to those maximum allowances. Amounts. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, Ellen. The first indicated speaker is Councillor Duffy. Sandra. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and thank you, Ellen, for the report. Um, and I know it is, it's quite detailed, um, but in terms of, I know this is the third year that we're, we're on now at this stage, um, I don't think that an awful lot has changed. I know we're still in the midst of a cost, cost of living crisis that is facing many of us. I do understand that that has implications for councillors as well. But I think in terms of our position of last year of asking for that independent review from DFC, I, I, it's my understanding that some work has been done on that. And I think that we should wait to see if there is an outcome. Um, I think that hopefully we will see an executive restored and we will see a minister that is in place um, to address many, many issues which are more important than this one. Um, but that that's where I believe that this uh, this decision should lie. So at this point, I would be um, supporting a continued deferral. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Next indicated speaker is Councillor Tierney. Ryan. Thank you, um, Chair, and thanks to Ellen um, for, the, for the report. Um, if it was inappropriate last year, um, there's not much has changed. Um, in all honesty, um, I fully understand and appreciate that there may be people um, within this elected body who feel that they deserve and need a, a pay increase. Absolutely do. Um, but I genuinely don't think that it's appropriate for, for us to be asked to, to, to make a vote on it. Um, we suggested and agreed last year that um, an independent review um, is, is the best way to go. Um, for example, MPs and MLAs um, don't vote on their own pay, um, and in my opinion, um, there should be no difference um, for councillors. I noticed within the report, um, however, that the CARES Dependence Allowance um, is included within that, um, and I think that's something um, that, and I know Ellen talked about um, there being some discretion um, within this report. I think that's something that we should consider. Um, because that is actually allowing people um, 
and supporting people to come and actually um, carry out the role of an elected councillor. Um, and I think that genuinely is something that we should um, give further consideration to. Um, the reality is, well, I suppose I have another um, slight concern, um, and I, I genuinely do think it's, it's inappropriate, and I'm not suggesting um, that, that we accept the recommendation. But, and I know previously we, we put the, the, the uplift into a uh, hardship fund. Where does this money go if it's not awarded in pay? Not that I am suggesting that Contras should get it, but I'm absolutely um, and totally against DFC holding on to it. Um, if it's going to be used, it should be used within this council area. Um, so I just want a wee bit of clarity around that and what discretion then there is for that amount of money to be used. Well, yeah, Ellen. Yeah. yeah, happy to respond to that. Um, um, as as Councillor Tierney has said, last year we did actually make an exception in terms of carers reliance in recognition of the fact that that was um, a, 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 a way of promoting equality of opportunity because there's an under representation generally in terms of parents and, and uh, females in chambers. So if members are happy to consider that, we can put in the, the update for it. It's not in any way significant. Um, and in terms of the issue of where does the money go, it's actually out of our budgets. So DFC aren't given us a pocket of money. Effectively, what we did last year was uh, rather than uh, make a pay award, um, the, the monies there, which comes out of our budgets, was reallocated to the hardship fund. So the FC is not holding on to anything. It affects our rates, basically. Um, and, and that obviously is a factor for members' consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, with that being said, um, I would suggest that we do take the same um, approaches last year um, and allow the CARES Alliance aspect of it um, to be um, looked at. And I know, um, Ellen, and I agree, you know, it's not um, any way, um, by any stretch of the imagination, a massive uplift, but it's also not hindrance to people either. Um, and I think that that's important. And as I said already, it, it supports and allows people um, that opportunity to, to fill out their role as an elected councillor. And I think that that's um, important and we shouldn't be seen to be blocking that. So I would make that as a as a proposal that we allow the CARES Alliance element of it to be awarded. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. I'm going to be awkward and say, can you put that in writing? And then I'm going to bring in Alderman Hussey and Councillor Hartman. Sorry. Uh, Derek? Thank you, Chair. Uh, members have heard me on this one before. The whole issue of allowances is something that NAC have been working on for years upon years. Uh, that annual basic allowance of 17,000 that is mentioned there is not something that councillors have construed. It is independently assessed that that is a proper basic allowance for a councillor working in local government in Northern Ireland. Uh, I know the independent uh, commission has been established. The chair has been, well, the chair is on board anyway. I'm not sure, but the, the wider element of it. And I know that NAC will be working to actually have that figure increased because NAC do not regard that as an, a suitable sum, an appropriate sum for councillors in local government in Northern Ireland. I would remind uh, uh, councillors of Item 11 on page 44, the renunciation. So, you know, on an individual basis, surely that should be the, the basis that would be used, that this chamber adopts the scheme of alliance and any councillor who feels that they uh, will, are not able to accept that, renunciate and hand that money back into the system. It's simple. Uh, I can think of an example, Councillor Gallagher is not here, but a couple of years ago I remember Councillor Gallagher saying he claims his travel allowance, but he then redistributes that, that uh, travel allowance to bodies within his own DEA, which is 
perfectly laudable. So all those options are open to individual councillors. But we have a representative body working their butts off on our behalf. This is what's currently there. They will be pushing for a lot more than that going forward. Uh, at least we should be backing our representative body. And I know that that representative body has the, the backing of the local government spokespersons of all the major parties in, in the Assembly. So it's a strange decision that Council would take. Thank you, Chair. We haven't taken it yet, Alderman and Jose, we need to have a vote. So I'm, I'm just getting you know, people's opinions here. Uh, the next opinion we're going to hear is Councillor Hargan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, we are happy to support a deferral on uh, increasing councillors' wages, and we're also happy to support the um, proposal to uplift uh, or increase CARES allowance. Um, I think that um, it, it, it is inappropriate for us to get a pay raise while uh, we have an across-the-board public sector strike plan for uh, January 18th, where you know teachers are going on strike. Uh, education workers are going on strike, TransLink workers are going on strike, uh, our roads workers are going on strike, um, health and social care workers are going on strike again, and they're mostly going all on strike for pay parity. It's not even for a proper pay increase, it's just to get pay parity with workers across the water. So I, I think it's important for us to send that message that we can see what's happening and we're not just going to you know, uh, in, increase our own pay. Um, if that pay parity issue gets resolved and we, can, we begin to move forward with pay, I think that this will not be a debate in the way that it's been inside the Council. I think Councillor Alderman Hussey is right. Uh, I think that for many people, Councillor pay is far too low, right, um, and does need to be increased. Um, and I would support that. I think my problem right now with saying, right, let people decide on an individual basis is if we do that um, and then DUP councillors vote themselves a raise and we all decide we don't want to take one, and they are in, in, in some ways, uh, along with the Secretary of State, fully to blame for the fact that there's been, there isn't pay parity and many other problems, I think that that wouldn't be right. So I, I think that this is something we should do collectively, um, and I think that that's uh, it's a way to stand in solidarity with hundreds of thousands of workers who are going to be going on strike on January 18th and having a massive rally in Derry and Belfast uh, and sacrificing and have been sacrificing for the last two three years in the these strikes. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Sean. We have two more indicated speakers. First, it's Alderman Kerrigan, and then it is Councillor Donnelly. Keith? Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. Uh, not a member of the committee, but uh, I do appreciate uh, you letting me in. Um, I do have concerns, as Alderman Hussey has raised there, and, and it's a wee bit... Uh, uh, I cannot, I'll not give as much of a touch, uh, um, but the issue is, you know, for someone that promotes unions and the work of unions, going against the union which we are all a member of in regards to the National Association of Councillors, as, as Alderman Hussey has raised, you know, and uh, for those that do attend, uh, you, you know, the NAC meetings, you, you know, you see the work that's been put on, in particular by the secondary, whose colleague, your, your own uh, chair, uh, and, uh, and and that, but it's, it's, uh, it, it is it is what it is, but as I say, it's entirely up to individuals what they wanted to do with their alliance. And, uh, you know, the situation is there, you, you know, we are been pushing that the workers in the council are, are paid. And again, we've had, we, we've had the uplift that they have received. And yet we as elected representatives are still on the same rate from uh, you know, 2019. So, uh, but it, it is, uh, it is deemed, but as I say, there's, there's a mechanism on it that whereby individuals can do uh, what, what they want with their alliance, which is given to them. If, if they wish to turn around and hand it to a charity or whatever they want to do, it's theirs to do what they wish. So I do think that it's, uh, and as I say, it's not set by us, it is set independently, but uh, that's an issue. Uh, so um, I would have been minded that it was uh, the recommendation should have been supported, but again, in, in regards to this proposal that's been put forward there uh, by Councillor Tierney, I think it's Councillor Tierney, apologies if I'm incorrect in that regard, the, the, uh, supporting the, the 
CARES Alliance one. We're, we're content to support that, but we would be reminded that the entire um, paper would have been supported. I do have one question, and um, it's, it's something that's maybe it's in my head, Chair, and uh, someone's told it to me, and I can't remember who, but it was a question in regards that when I read through the papers, there is a, effectively a 6,000 underspend from what I see with a reduction there for the uh, chair of the Audit Assurance Risk Committee and the vice chair because they meet on a bi-monthly instead of every month. And I had it in my head that somebody said to me that there was a potential of a slight additional allowance being allocated to those that sit on the planning committee and will declare an interest that they sit on the planning committee, but it was just a question. And as you, Chair, as you've seen yourself, the, the work times that was caught to the planning committee, but particularly when we were working through LDP, planning committee could have been meeting three or four times in the month at a stage. But it was just that question, and I probably asked that already, Helen. Is that something that ever was considered, or have I made that up, or, or is it not practical to, to do anything with that, or is that money then lost, or can we do something with that money uh, to allocate it somewhere else? Yeah, you know, or is that, as I say, maybe it's just, as you have maybe answered previously, is this just part of our budget and we don't spend it, it's doing us no harm? So it's just that's an actual question for Ellen uh, in regards to it. Thank you very much, Chair. Alderman Kerry, are you on the planning committee? I do sit on the planet, so I don't well, declare an interest on it. I take that as a declaration of interest. Ellen, do you need to address that point? Yes, um, uh, through you, Chair. The uh, scheme or the circular issued by the DFC allows a maximum um, provision of uh, basic and responsibility of allowances of in and around, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's £83,000. Uh, when we actually reduced the frequency of the audit committee and subsequently reduced the chairs and the deputy chairs allowances for that committee, that realised a differential of approximately £6,000 per annum. That is sitting as a part of the council's budgets, so it's, it, you know, it's retained within council. Um, uh, so, again, in, in terms of the consideration of whether there was extra to be paid to planning committee, um, it was never actually approved or anything like that there. And it would remain, it would mean that we would overturn the um, previous decision that all the chairs of all of the committees had an equal payment. Um, it is certainly true that some councils do have an approach where there's a differential for planning, but it isn't something that has has featured in a conversation in recent times. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Alderman Kerrigan? Yeah, no, no, thank you, Chair. I just I knew someone had raised it, but I couldn't remember what. And I, I'm not saying that it ever was passed by the council, but someone raised it in a previous discussion at some stage. I think it might even before I came on to council, but someone raised it. So as I say, as long as it's not just something I've made up. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Keith. Uh, next syndicated speaker is Councillor Donnelly. Then I'm going to bring in Councillor Tierney about his amendment. And then I'm going to bring in Councillor Duffy to possibly speak in the amendment. Not required. Right. Thanks. So, Councillor Donnelly. Or am I on it, Chair? Chair, I think what needs to be pointed out in this debate or discussion is that, you know, there is a perception out there. Politicians, uh, the word politician is, is, is uh, it's a dirty word, sort of, at the minute. And there's a lot of uh, resentment towards politicians. And there's a perception that all politicians have their snout in the trough and they're on the gravy train. You know, that may be true to, to, to some politicians in Stormont and Westminster, but the fact that, that councillors, they're on 15 grand a year, isn't, you can't, it's not, certainly not part of uh, a gravy train. And I was at a, a course last month when some of this resentment regarding elected representatives was manifesting. And there was a comment made that, uh, well, they should stop their big money. And there was a former councillor from a party at that meeting, and she made the point that exactly that the, the councillors aren't on a huge wage and that she was aware of some councillors having to use food banks. So I just want to make that, that point too, that most councillors I know they cost their jobs on a daily basis. They work long 
uh, hours and they work very, very hard for a very, in the terms of things, small amount of, of money. I'm content with, 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 with what I'm getting. But there is an, an element that, that if you're advocating for proper wages for strikers and that, and they're on significant amount more money than what elected representatives in, in council get, then there is an uneasiness in that. There, there certainly is amongst myself. Uh, there are some councillors who are full time. They don't have a second uh, job. And there are some households where there's only one wage going into that home. And that wage will then have to be topped up by by benefits. Uh, I just wanted to make that point. I do agree that it's uneasy and awkward for councillors to be voting for a pay raise for their for themselves. So I'm going to abstain on that. But I do agree with uh, Councillor Tierney's uh, amendment the other day. I just think it's important they 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 put that from for me. It's important anyway they put that out there uh, so that it's known. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. So, uh, Councillor Tierney? Chair, sure, thank you. Um, and I suppose um, to follow on from what, what Councillor Donnelly is saying, and I totally and absolutely uh, agree with, with, with every word that he said. Um, I think part of um, my reason around um, this proposal um, and, and the reason that I wanted to come back in again is because I think part of it has been lost um, on, on some of the, the speakers. Um, the NAC are um, working very hard to try um, and get the, the scheme uplifted quite a lot more than what has been suggested here. Um, and it's not about going against the, the union, um, if you want to call the, the NAC um, our, our trade union. But for me, it's the uncomfortableness of having to vote to say, yes, I think we should get a pay raise. I, I just don't think it's, it's appropriate. I fully agree with Councillor Donnelly around councillors work extremely hard um, on a day-to-day -day basis and sometimes um, put on very, very long hours. Um, and for the, the remuneration that they get, it sometimes doesn't equate. But it's not about the, the writ. It's not about what the NAC are doing. And it's not about uh, trying to block it or, or anything like that. Because there are people, and as Councillor Donnelly has, has outlined, you know, there could there could be. I don't know of anybody, but Councillor Donnelly has, has indicated that he may be aware of councillors who have to use a food bank and who deserve and need this uplift. But I just think it's wrong of us to be awarding it to ourselves, regardless of whether the figure that has been arrived at in the scheme of allowances has been arrived at independently. I, I fully appreciate that you're still voting to accept it and i don't think it's right we um, went through um an awful lot of discussion last year um, around council staff um pay up bluffs. we didn't invite the staff on and ask them to give us a, a figure of, of what they wanted we said it and they accepted it and you know that was a completely different process to what's going on here and and for for us it's just uncomfortable and we would prefer that an independent body um is set up to they uh to, to do this um a similar as i said already the, the mps and uh mlas thank you thank you councillor tierney uh so we have no more indicated speakers my take on this is that councillor duffy proposed that we reject the circular until such time that there's an independent body that looks into councillors' pay and terms and conditions, etc., etc. That was subsequently amended by Councillor Tierney, um, who said we reject it except for the element about um, carers, dependents, allowance, which is consistent with the approach that we adopted last year. Um, there has been I'm not going to call it dissent. You know, people have said they're going to abstain. So I'm going to have to call a vote on this, unfortunately. So, Chief Executive, would you like to take us through that? So on the amendment, yeah, vote on the amendment first and then the substantive motion. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Chair. So members were voting on the amendment on the screen. Um, Alderman Cook. Abstain. Alderman Hussey. Board. Councillor Boggs. Uh. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Sandra Duffy. Councillor Farrell. For. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Heaney. Uh. Councillor Jackson. Uh. Councillor Mooney. Councillor Farrell. Councillor Tierney. Thank you, members. So, Ten four and one abstention in relation to the amendment. So the amendment passes. And Chair, do you want me to check yep. now in terms of the overall substantive motion, which now incorporates the amendment? Is there any change of vote? What is the motion? I think the chair. Uh, well, the, the motion is that we reject the circular apart from the carers dependence alliance uplift so that's a substantive motion now thank you chair members are clear on that is there any change of vote from the there is a change of vote okay so is, is that for alderman uh, i was for the amendment but i'm against the no substantive motion uh, given that it's rejecting the recommendation, which is what I presume. Okay. And are other members for? No. Sorry, I'll maybe just do a wee quick. Thank you. Um, Alderman Cook? Abstain. Abstain. Alderman Hussey? Against. Against. Um, Councillor Boggs? Ha. Councillor Donnelly? Abstain. Councillor Duffy's not here. Councillor Farrell? For. Councillor Harkin? Councillor Heaney? No. Councillor Jackson? Ha. Councillor Mooney? Councillor Farrell? Ha. And Councillor Tierney? So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, four, one against, and two abstentions. So the substantial notice of motion passes. Chair, okay. can I just check? Are we able to vote on a motion proposed by someone who's left the room? Yep. Well, thanks for taking us through that vote, Chief Executive. Uh, the next item is item 10, uh, which is the sixth monthly progress report for strategic planning and support units delivery plan. And we have Ellen Kavner to take us through that. Ellen. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report advised members and seeks uh, comments and endorsement in relation to the progress against the uh, strategic planning and support. Um, Strategic and Support Units Delivery Plan for 2023-24. Um, this is the six-month report and, and indeed, um, as I say, the background and context um, and how it forms part of the improvement framework as outlined in Section 2. Um, the report itself at Appendix 1 provides an overview of progress against the individual actions that were identified in the strategic plan, which was uh, agreed at committee in um, at the March meeting of this particular committee. Um, the overall report indicates that our target uh, progress is in line with expectations with a 59% overall delivery uh, as opposed to a 50% target. And therefore, the recommendation in front of members this afternoon, afternoon is a subject to your comments that the progress report um, is endorsed. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ellen. Um, do we have a proposer? Anybody? Mr. Mooney, would you like to speak on it? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a seconder? Mr. Heaney? Oh, it is. Well done. Uh, the next item is item 11, which is the draft audit, audit of inequalities and equality action plan 24 to 26. And again, we have Ellen to take us through that item. Ellen. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, this report updates members on the Council's draft Audit of Inequalities for 2024, which is set out at Appendix 1, and, and seeks your comments and input into this document and associated Equality Action Plan. And I mean, subject to your comments um, or, and, and, and in terms of today, uh, approval is sought to commence a consultation process to seek further internal and external input into the document. Um, to ensure that robustness um, is maximised and a, and a quality impact assessment process is, is progressed. Um, now, as indicated in the report, uh, the Equality Commission would recommend uh, doing periodically an audit of inequalities, and that helps to identify at a strategic level the inequalities in the area and therefore help inform um, the action plan, the equality action plan, which is set out at Appendix 2. It's noted again, as I say, was in the report, that that helps um, identify those issues which Council can can influence as well as those, you know, rather looking at things at an individual policy level. Um, again, the report highlights that this is a draft document. Um, we are keen to get input from all of the stakeholders and are obviously are keen then to consult and will be allowing a 12 week period. Um, and indeed, um, as I say, we will, through that, that process, engage directly with people on a face to face basis, as well as um, encouraging an online facility. Um, in terms of the recommendations, therefore, in front of members this afternoon is um, this is the draft uh, audit of inequalities and the action plan, and it's subject to your comments. We commence a consultation exercise. Um, as, as I say, members, I would highlight that that um, whilst there is extensive information there, that we, we would fully accept that other people may have um, views that will enhance this documentation further. So, as I say, that's where we see the value in the consultation. Thank you, members. Thank you for that, Ellen. First indicated speaker is Alderman Hossey. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ellen. Very comprehensive. Uh, when you go beyond uh, a couple of pages that we just dealt with, when you go into the, the consultation itself, uh, I suppose, is 12 weeks long enough to do what, what you're suggesting will be undertaken during that period of time? Certainly, that's our recommended limitation. Um, what we'll probably do before we actually release a document is do a consultation plan. And if we feel we're tight on it, we haven't got resources, then we'll extend the period. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I propose a recommendation. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Do we have a seconder or Councillor Jackson? Do you wish to speak to it? Mm -hmm. Does anybody else wish to ask any questions or offer any comments? No. So that's proposed by Alderman Hussey, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Um, next item is item 12, which is the review of the disability scheme and action plan for Derry City and Saban District Council. And again, we've got Ellen to take us through that paper. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, this report presents for members' consideration a draft uh, disability scheme and action plan for the period, um, three-year period 24-26. Again, we're con we're, what we're suggesting here is that subject to your views, we commence a consultation exercise to hopefully enhance those documents uh, further. And I would also highlight that it's because it's um, a focus on disability, then we'll obviously be taking proactive steps to engage directly with people with a disability who would be directly affected. Um, as highlighted in the background, I, and, and I suppose the name is a wee bit um, um, of a bit of a confusion, that this disability scheme and action plan relates specifically to two duties, and they are to promote positive attitudes towards people with disabilities and also to encourage uh, participation uh, by disabled people in, in public life. Um, th so therefore, um, the documents themselves contain an affirmation of the Council's existing commitments, um, which were previously um, approved by the Equality Commission. Um, and we have 
continued as a CAT in house, what we've um, already built upon in terms of our scheme and added and updated actions for the 24-26 uh, period. Again, as I say, the recommendation in front of members today is subject to your comments. Approval is given to commence a consultation exercise and uh, an equality impact assessment in result in respect of the scheme and the action plan. Thank you, members. Thank you again, Ellen. Uh, would any members wish to comment? Councillor Heaney? Chair, sure, just have it repose. And Councillor Mooney? Happy second, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Alderman Hussey, you're happy? All right. So, proposed by Councillor Heaney, seconded by Councillor Mooney. And last but not least, we've got item 13, which is the overview of language events. And again, that's going to be delivered by Ellen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, this report provides, uh, and what we do this is generally annually, uh, an overview of recent projects and initiatives undertaken by Council to promote the languages of Irish and Ulster Scots. Um, and, and clearly, as I say, this helps demonstrate how Council has taken forward its duties in fulfilling the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, and also in delivering its commitment to promote and celebrate linguistic diversity throughout the city and district as detailed in the language policies. Um, as, 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 as highlighted in the background there, um, hopefully these uh, activities demonstrate um, our efforts to enhance access to council services and information in, in Irish language and Ulster Scots and to promote and safeguard both of those languages. Um, as, as, and just to say, the key issues really are that uh, in addition to the, the undertakings we've set out in terms of our Irish and Ulster Scots policy. Um, we've also had um, devised a programme of events and initiatives to raise awareness of that diversity, and those are set out in the appendices. The recommendations in front of members this afternoon, therefore, are that you note the positive work undertaken by Council uh, to date in terms of promoting languages of Irish and Ulster Scots within the city and district and for fulfilling our obligations to take resolute action to safeguard both languages um, and also that you endorse the current approach. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ellen. And so, Councillor O'Farrell. Uh, uh, hi, Hurley. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And Ellen, Gurumila Mayogar, Ashian, Vishina Rose, thank you very much for that. Now, I have to say, uh, you're doing an excellent job. The, the council workers, the, the officers who are actually working on the Irish language in the Ulster Scots, I have to sing their praises to high heaven. They're doing great work all the year. Gurumila Mayogar, Ashian, thank you very much for that. Do we have you proposed that? Yep. And do we have a seconder? Mr. Boggs. So that is open for decision uh, concluded. We have four items open for information. Would anybody like to call, comment on any of those? No. Um, right. So can I have a proposer to move on to confidential? Uh, Mr. Mooney. Seconded by Councillor Tierney. Uh, would they get the nod from the corner? 